The NBA season is over, meaning the rights deal is on the clock. And Messi to MLS. And who's this? John, you're back. Hey, I had a great day off. My daughter graduated from high school. It was great to see. A much better day than Yankees radio announcer John Sterling had last week when he called this foul ball on WFAN. Now the 3 2 swung on, a pop foul back here. Ow! 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 And we're back. The Marshand and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshand, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. John, great to have you back. Uh, Colin Cowherd filling in for you was tremendous. Got a lot of great feedback from that. If you didn't listen, some people who said, I didn't think I'd like Colin, uh, and they ended up really loving hearing what he had to say and, and liking him even more than a lot of people who are big fans of his uh, who uh, chimed into me and really enjoyed learning more. John, uh, and your day off was good? Yeah, I have a nit to pick with oh. you, Andrew. So you're talking to Colin Cowherd, and like you just sort of, you know, you're asking him questions, and you offer Colin, you're like, hey, you want to come back next week? Come on back. He can't come back this week. I'm here this week. What are you trying to give up my job? What's going on here? It's kind of be like ESPN radio with Mike Greenberg on the Greeny show. Um, <laughs> Chris Parlin and Chris Canty are on like almost every day. It was, we will still call it the Mars Shannon Orient Sports Media Podcast. It just will be Colin and me. All right. <laughs> you can keep your name on it and all the royalties. Also, one other note before we get to who's up, who's down. John Sterling was okay uh, on that foul ball. Uh, you can see the video online as well, but he was okay. We wouldn't have used it at the at the top. Can I say one thing about Sterling? If I got hit by a foul ball, I would have cursed. How did he not curse on that? That's That was a phenomenal bit of restraint right there, I think. A hundred percent. All right, who's up? Who's down? Who's up? Who's down? John, you're back. Why don't you lead off? All right, I'll lead us off. My who's up? Rob Manfred, the commissioner of Major League Baseball, and it has to do with the RSNs, which are in disarray right now. So Rob Manfred and all of MLB's executive team said that if Diamond Sports doesn't pay a team and they get the rights back, they will be able to step in within a day, get the rights and produce an MLB quality level broadcast. I was skeptical. I didn't think they'd be able to do it. I didn't think they'd be able to negotiate deals with the local distributors, cable and satellite companies. Well, the Padres on May 31st got their rights back and MLB came in right away, delivered a great telecast. The the production quality of the telecast is, is really, really good. They got on all the local cable systems. They're getting streamed uh, locally. It's been going for two weeks now without a hitch. It's not a fluke. I didn't know when when they were talking about uh, doing this, it seemed like they were bluffing almost. Uh, Diamond called their bluff. It wasn't a bluff, Andrew. They really did it. They they did a good job with it. RSN uh, problems continue to march on. There's now a blueprint for all the other teams. All right. My who's up is Apple and Eddie Q. Uh, who oversees the MLS deal. I could put the MLS in here as well. The reason, Lionel Messi, uh, the signing. Uh, To me, this is a game changer for Apple in in terms of the subscription service with MLS. The big thing that they wanted was to be able to sell these subs worldwide and no one better on an individual basis than Lionel Messi, even at 35 years old. Uh, I think they're... I think they're in 109 countries uh, with MLS season pass um, around that. And they're going to sell a lot of subs because Messi is the type of player that you, yeah, you could just wait for the highlights and those are great, but he also just, he walks around the field now at 35 a lot. And then all of a sudden just a little bit of magic. Uh, And I get it. Some people say retirement league retirement, that he's the greatest player ever. Most people would say, I think, I mean, there's an argument and I think having him on your uh, service, We'll get into this more in the topics, but having on your service is a great thing for Apple. Uh, the Copas, uh, the South American Championship, are going to be held in the United States in two years. Then uh, the World Cups in 26. It all lines up. 
uh, for soccer's growth. Um, and I think a really good day for Eddie Q, Apple, and MLS. I'm going to do my who's down is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And it's because uh, the XFL, uh, as reported by Jabari Young and Forbes, lost uh, a significant amount of money. But for me, it's less about losing money because any league in its first year is going to lose a boatload. That was expected. What, what I was not expecting was the layoffs that occurred there, including two of the top marketing uh, executives at the XFL. I was told that uh, they laid off dozens of employees. And that suggests to me that the losses that were incurred are actually much greater than, than were anticipated. And it also, also suggests that, that they're going to have a different strategy moving forward against marketing and more toward sort of uh, sponsorship sales and getting uh, butts in seats and uh, try, trying to uh, work on attendance. If you're starting a league, you need all of those. You can't start cutting one and start doing the other. So I, the, the XFL right now, there's some red flags that, that are uh, starting to pop up around that, that league. Yeah, and one note, too, is that the, the XFL is not getting any rights fee from ESPN. Uh, I know I think that was out there. Uh, there's no rights fee involved in that. They're, they're just on the air because uh, it, it wouldn't make sense. I think there was a report of $20 million. There, There's no rights fee at all, according to my sources. All right, my who's down? The CW. This live PGA golf uh, affair uh, is very strange still to this day that it happened. Uh, it's still kind of unclear, even though there seem to be some tr strategic leaks to try to like, you know, to buff everything up a little bit to say, oh, we had to do this. We were fighting them and saying all these terrible things, but you know, we couldn't fight them. We're Jay Monahan and the PGA, and we just had to put our hands up and, and do a deal with them. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But the CW to me is definitely uh, the ones who are the, the losers here, not because they, they hadn't invested as far as I understand, too much money, if at all, in live. But if they're truly trying to get in the sports, this is a blow because however this deal, if it does go through and, and, it, and it happens, uh, the I think one thing is clear that the live golf brand, if that even continues, is going to be less than the PGA and those events will be lesser and the emphasis will be on the PGA events and there's a pretty good chance the live won't even exist uh, next couple of years. Uh, and so to me, if the CW is really truly trying to get into sports, I think that was a blow for them in terms of uh, uh, the live PGA merger takeover, whatever we want to call it. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out, but I don't think it's good for the CW. Well, let's get into the topics, uh, Andrew. Topic number one, the NBA finals, which ended on Monday with the Denver Nuggets uh, w winning the title in five games over the Miami Heat. There are a couple things I want to bring up uh, about this, Andrew. One is there's always been this idea that players have to go to Los Angeles or New York or, you know, you need to be in a big market. Milwaukee won a couple of years ago with Giannis. And then you had uh, you, you had Denver just winning now uh, th this year with uh, the, the Joker. The idea of the super teams, like I'm not sure if that, if that exists anymore. And the super teams that are set up in these big media markets or these uh, really sought after markets, uh, it appears that, that the NBA is moving away from that a little bit. And I think this is the story we are looking at going into the finals and, you know, we're taping finals just ended the night previous. The ratings were good, right? They're very solid. They didn't get the Lakers Celtics, which uh, according to our ratings guru, Austin Karp from SBJ. Karp's Corner. Corpse Corner would have been worth a couple extra million viewers, but they did well. Um, and I think if you're the NBA, you got to be, you got to be, as we head into the negotiations at the end of the year into next year, you have to, well, look, Denver and the Heat, that's, you know, yeah, you could have Sacramento or somebody like that, but that's a pretty bad matchup for us in terms of the finals. And we're still drawing. We still got 11 million people about a night. Um, and, uh, we don't have the final ratings, like I said. And you know, Andrew, it's not just the, those two teams. It was a five-game series. Mm, like yep. you, you, you need you need the, the games to go, the series to go six games or seven games to really get the the, uh, the interest level going and the uh, the viewership going. So to th have it five games and still have maintain those uh, the, the viewerships numbers that they had is significant for the NBA. 
And what did you think of the earlier start times? I loved them. I loved everything about them, Andrew. Like I, I stay up to watch these games and just that extra half hour at the end of the night just to you, to get to bed a little bit earlier, I think was, was uh, good. And I think this is something that the NBA is going to continue doing in their conference finals and in their finals uh, go- going into next year and possibly the year after. What I find to be so surprising about this is that I have spent decades writing stories based on research that says that later start times lead to bigger ratings. Uh, it leads to bigger ratings in every single demo because you just start to bring in people from the West Coast. And if the games are good, people stick with them past 11, 1130. And every network makes those decisions. We see the NCAA men's basketball championship game tip off after 930 based on based on that formula. Well, what the NBA has been hearing, they've been hearing these complaints from the uh, from particularly East Coast viewers, and they've noticed that the houses using television and the people using television, those different mes- metrics, they are a little bit higher earlier in the evening. So they they tinkered with going uh, starting the games at, at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, which is 5.30 on the West Coast. They saw through the conference finals and the first couple of games of the NBA finals, they saw about a, a 28% increase in ratings in the East Coast, but only a small ratings decrease on the West Coast. So they, 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 there's so much more viewership to gain on the East Coast versus losing viewership on the West Coast that they haven't made the decision yet, but you can bet that they almost certainly will be uh, using the early start times next season. And it makes sense. Like, look, you're gonna, you're, it's impossible to please everybody because of the three-hour time difference. But if you do start at 530, that, that's a little early for a lot of people to get home from work. But getting home by 7 is much more reasonable. I know there's terrible traffic in certain, you know, California stuff, places like that. But, but getting home by 7 and seeing the second half is pretty reasonable. My theory, Andrew, is COVID. A lot more people are working from home now. So, so you, you, you're not battling that, that rush hour traffic. Yeah, that's a good point. So I, I like that too. The other night I was, uh, you know, out a little bit late for the kids event, got home, uh, not, almost nine 45 or so. And it's like, all right, cool. We're like late third going to the fourth quarter. Uh, this is great. I'll stay up and watch the end of this. Andrew, starting next season, who's out there? Who's a free agent that we should expect to see on air, uh, with the NBA next year? I think the big one is Doc Rivers, uh, you know, who got let go as a 76ers coach. Uh, he's been an analyst a number of times uh, in his career uh, at ABC. Uh, he was with Al Michaels back in the day. He's very tight with Mike Breen. That's something to watch if there's ever movement. Uh, there was talk about from Mark Stein uh, in his newsletter about uh, the possibility of Jeff Van Gundy uh, being a top assistant for Jason Kidd with the Mavericks. Uh, I don't think it's happening yet, but if that were to occur, you know, Doris Burke would obviously be in there as well. Uh, They do like JJ Redick a lot, Richard Jefferson, but I think Doc Rivers might get a look, um, you know, possibly as well. Uh, And so he's out there uh, and you kind of would expect him to get uh, picked up by someone uh, to do games. I I think that's something to watch for certain, Uh, but there could be movement. And then we're a couple of years away from when we'll probably have a new player uh, in the game. And, and that will probably shake things up a little bit. Andrew, you touched on this earlier, uh, the NBA rights deal. They, their deal is coming up. They have two more seasons with ESPN and Turner, uh, and then they're going to have a new deal. Certainly they'll have a deal in place, uh, before that I expect, uh, next summer ish, they should have a, a, a deals in place. They're going to get out of their exclusive negotiating windows with ESPN and Turner, early next year, uh, and then everybody else is coming in. I still feel that the NBA is very well situated given the interest from the digital streamers and given the interest from the traditional uh, media companies, and nothing that I saw in this year's playoffs dissuaded me of that. Yeah, let's just go what we know. Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, he basically said they're going to add a digital player. Uh, in the next deal. So we know there's going to be at least three packages. Uh, I, If I were to project right now, this is what I see. Um, I think ESPN and Turner stay involved. I think they maybe do a little bit less regular season 
Uh, I think Turner maybe ends up on Tuesday instead of Thursday, opening up Thursday for either Amazon or Apple, which I think is going to be a dogfight for Thursday. Uh, and then ESPN has uh, probably Friday on ESPN, Saturday on, on ABC, or maybe it's Wednesday and Saturday uh, in terms of uh, the ESPN aspect of it. I think NBC will be involved. I don't know if they're going to break the bank for it. So that kind of makes me a little leery of them getting it. I do think broadcast has become more important. Uh, ESPN and ABC are going to, of course, try to keep the finals. Uh, Turner doesn't have a broadcast component. You know, I, you know, the idea of partnering with CBS, you know, they do that on the NCAA tournament. I don't think that's happening at least right now, but I, I don't think you can't not think that's possible. Um, and so, uh, Fox has already said they're out. Uh, and so I think those are the players for the NBA. You agree with that assessment? Uh, I agree with almost everything you said. I think that it's going to be Amazon and Apple sort of battling for a streaming package. I believe that NBC and Turner are really going to be battling for for uh, a package. And I would I will be it will be the story of my career if somehow ESPN loses the NBA rights. I, I, I can't foresee that happening. I expect that the NBA finals are going to be on ABC moving forward. Um, I, potentially there could be a massive uh, uh, bid from an Apple or an Amazon, but even if that happens, I, I, I think I see the NBA really prioritizing broadcast television and, and wanting to stay on broadcast television and the reach of broadcast television. Also next season, they're going to start the in-season tournament. And so when they go, this isn't going to be the same um, packages that we're looking at right now. So by the time the new deals come around, somebody's going to bid on that uh, in-season tournament. That could be something that goes to the streamers easily. Maybe that's something to, to um, mollify you know, Turner. Um, you know, who knows? But that's going to be another package that's created out of thin air almost that they're going to be able to, to, to work out. Uh, I, I think that NBC is, is going to be, uh, I, I, I think they're going to be particularly aggressive. What I'm looking at is Adam Silver has said that, it, that there, there's going to be a streaming package. What if, I, I, I think Amazon is likely to get it, uh, may, maybe Apple, but what if NBC says, no, no, Peacock is the streaming package. Give us that streaming package. Or what if it's yeah, I mean, ESPN it's Plus? Or I mean, those are streamers. They get they get younger audiences. So there's a possibility there too. There is, but um, I think it's going to be Apple or Amazon. Uh, if I were to put my money on, I think they want also those tech companies involved. At least one of them, if not both. They they want those company involved. It's like the NFL. They want to give they want to give the tech tech, tech companies just a taste, like taste this exactly. and, and fall in love with it. Yeah, exactly. All right, we're gonna hit a lot of topics. Uh, as we go forward, let's start with one. Uh, and this is a huge one. Uh, you talked about this hurricane in our preview of the year ahead. Uh, you've been dead on as a forecaster. You could be a uh, weatherman in your future if, when uh, Colin Coward replaces you. Uh, and so <laughs> when we look at the RSNs, give us the update with Diamond Sports and what's going on with them. A weatherman, Bob Iger, that's good company. I'll there take that, Andrew. Absolutely. Okay. The next four weeks are going to be really telling for Diamond Sports and the RSNs. There are five teams over those four weeks that they're, they're due payments. And Diamond has already told MLB and those teams that it's going to start getting rid of contracts that don't make sense and focusing only on the ones that do make sense. So earlier, they gave up the Padres. Uh, that was a contract that did not make sense. Diamond did not make money on it. MLB took it over, and now that th they're running it. So the day after this podcast publishes on June fifteenth, the Rangers deal is up, uh, and so th they have to make a decision on whether or not they're going to pay the Rangers. July first, the Guardians, the Twins, the Diamondbacks. This is like a tide at the ocean. They keep coming up, and so they have to make a, the, the Diamond Sports has to make a decision on, on uh, those teams as well. It's unlikely that Diamond is gonna get rid of all four of those teams. The one that I think is most at risk is the Twins. And that's mainly because their deal with Diamond ends after this season. They haven't talked to Diamond at all. It's more than unlikely that they're not gonna do a deal with Diamond uh, moving forward. Then you have uh, in the middle of uh, July, July 15th, the Reds are up. And that's another one to, to keep your eye on because the Reds, like the Padres, it's a contract that Diamond executives have said that they don't love. 
it's outside of the bankruptcy, so they can just drop it with impunity. They don't have to put it in front of any kind of bankruptcy judge. The reason why these four weeks are so important is because we're going to get a look at what Diamond's strategy is. Are they bluffing? Are they going to keep these rights or are they going to start to pick and choose which ones they want to keep? Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big uh, month for the, uh, the business right now. And we've talked about this a lot and you've been on it. What an absolute mess. <laughs> when, you just, when you're talking about it, it's just a total mess. And look, let me just go back to something you said um, on the Padres and where look, like, would the Twins do this too, right? Do you think that works? Can the Twins be successful with this model? How do you define success? This is, uh, yeah, no, they won't be successful. So the, uh, Rob Manfred has, has said that they're going to pay up to like 80% of the rights fees to these teams. How much farther longer can that go on? And how much in your market are the Yankees or the Mets willing to subsidize all these teams that are having their RSN deals go haywire. So it, 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 it's it's not a long-term solution. There's less money to be made from streaming than from traditional the, the traditional cable bundle. And it's that's why this is such a fascinating story. Yeah, I don't think they're very into subsidizing. Yeah, I don't think the Yankees, I know, aren't very into subsidizing the other teams um, for my <laughs> covering the Yankees. I don't think they're into that. All right, Messi to MLS. Uh, you've been talking about this for a while. Eddie Q, as your who's up, let me bring a, a, a dose of reality in here, Andrew. What makes this different than David Beckham to uh, MLS? Because I will suggest to you that my wife and daughters knew Bend It Like Beckham, but they, they really don't know Messi as much. Okay. Good question. Thank and, you. I'm you know, paid to you know, ask good questions. Eddie Q, the other day, they had like an Apple call. He didn't take questions. Maybe he'll take questions next time, But um, which I'd recommend to Apple. The, but I will take questions. So to answer your question, <laughs> here's number one. Uh, David Beckham's not Lionel Messi as a player, right? Messi's the best ever. And it's not only – it's how he plays. It's not just that he's – like even if Ronaldo had come, like I don't think that's as – like Ronaldo's – tremendous and it's kind of been like uh brady and manning with uh messi and ronaldo for all these years now messi's kind of moved ahead of them just because of longevity and he, he just won the world cup but you know there are people who probably think ronaldo's better just like some people think peyton manning's better than brady even though brady you know won more uh so but it's how he plays as number one number two when we talk about what we talk about all the time media this media deal is perfect for Lionel messi that's why um, if reports are correct that he's getting a cut of Apple subscriptions, it makes sense because an individual can sell subscriptions. You know, there there are people around the world. Like, like think about Michael Jordan. Like, forgetting like how his career went, where he went to baseball and all that it was at the end of his career, and there's three years left, and this is the only way you can watch him. And it's not like Messi's at the end. like yeah, he's not as good as he once was. He just led his team to the World Cup. He was the most important player on that team. He's not like done and this is like he's going to retire. Now, will Messi be as into it? Um he does like there are going to be people who watch the game and be like he's just walking around the field the whole time because he does that for Argentina. That's how he plays. Uh, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, he gets a couple of touches and he he looks sort of disinterested in a way, and I could see that being a criticism. But they're selling subs all around the world. And this is the most popular athlete maybe in the world right now. Uh, and he's the greatest. And this is going to be the end of his career. And in on the United States front, uh, Copa Americas are going to be here. He figures to play in that with Argentina. The World Cup, he probably, I'd say, things are going right. He plays another World Cup uh, in, in the United States. And so, look, I think there were reports that he was offered three years uh, and more than a billion dollars, maybe 1.6 billion to, to go to Saudi Arabia. I think this deal, like, I, again, I don't know the exact particulars. I'm sure this is going to could approach a billion dollars. And I would argue now, look, obviously there's a price where it doesn't make sense, but it might like any price almost would make sense for MLS because he's just that good and that much of a difference maker. And he might bring some other really good players with him to Miami. Now the question is, can you grow off of that if you're MLS? Who else can you bring? And when do you change your model where you're trying for Messi when he's 25, the, you know, the next Messi when he's 25. But I would say though, if you could sign any player in the world right now, any player, 20 year old player, 25 year old player, 35 year old player, 
and you could only sign one of them, I would sign Lionel Messi if I'm the ML, if I'm MLS. Uh, there's reasons for why this happened. With the, I think, you know, again, I don't know Messi, but he wanted to maybe go back to Barcelona. They couldn't because of financial reasons in terms of how things are structured. They couldn't bring him back. Uh, so whatever, however he got to Miami, uh, it's tremendous for uh, for the league. The in-game experience, I've said a number of times, is already very good for MLS when you go to a game. When Messi shows up, it's going to be off the charts uh, when he's in New York or Houston or wherever. That's a guaranteed sellout. Uh, and the tickets on the secondary market will be really high. And I also, this is, I wrote this in my newsletter. They need to figure out a way. He can't be playing. They can't have all these games on Saturday. That doesn't work. Okay. I don't think it works without Messi. Uh, it's it's fine. Like you can get most of the games on Saturday night. That's fine. They, they like it. I think they bring in uh, fans and they there's more in stadium. It works better that way. And, and you do need kind of a set schedule. That made some sense. You need to showcase Messi. And I said Monday night Messi, uh, you know, I'd make, you know, Monday night football for soccer. And, you know, he wouldn't play every week, of course, but he'd play a lot on those Mondays because if you're trying to sell subs uh, in the United States domestically, you want him to taste your league on one night and then get Messi another night. And now you're just getting him one shot because most people, you're not going to go watch another game, especially an MLS game when they're, you know, Premier League and Champions League and uh, Mexican League, uh, German League, Italian League. Those are all still better. Uh, you know, overall, and that's not close, but they got messy and he's somebody you're going to put down a uh, hundred bucks for, for a year. If you could see everyone in his games, Miami plays at DC United Audi field in early July. I have tickets. I was so excited. And they told me, uh, he, he's not playing until like July 21st. So I like, uh, I'm going to see him. Uh, God, I actually went to Neymar side with PSG. My, I have cousins who live in France. And I before we before he signed, I said, "Hey, do you, can you, is there a way to get tickets? Because we kind of, or you know, when they come here, you know, whatever we bet, we get the tickets when they go there, they get the tickets." And so they had tickets. They gave me the tickets. It ended up being Neymar's first game at PSG. Now I've covered some big events. That was the best thing I ever went to. I don't even like really <laughs> Neymar that much, but that was just so amazing. They're good seats, and it was awesome. Here's what I've uh, that, that I'm going to be looking at is. Uh, I know it was a different media environment and it was a different time, but when Beckham started at uh, in MLS, there was broadcast coverage of it. There was ESPN had it and it, it felt and looked and, uh, and was treated by ESPN and MLS as a big event. Every time he, every time he played now, all MLS games are on Apple TV plus. And so uh, that that's, how much is a streamer going to be able to really help drive in America? I'm not talking about international subs, so because I, I, I get that aspect of it. But in the United States, how much is a streamer going to be able to help sort of drive and make the sport a little bit, a lot more popular? In DC, just a, just a, to finish a quick thought, in DC we had Wayne Rooney play, and that that coincided with. DC United going off a of TV and and doing the, these awful streaming deals and no like Wayne Rooney went to playgrounds and in, in, uh, in our neighborhood nobody nobody noticed him nobody recognized him. And Wayne, like, look, I don't want to take anything away from uh, Wayne Rooney who had a tremendous career. I'm an Anglophile, Andrew. Yeah, well, but but he's not Messi's Michael Jordan. He's LeBron James. So it's it's different, right? Um, David Beckham was a great player. But see, but you're looking at this, you're looking at this as a soccer fan. I'm trying to think about who is going to get the casual fans that aren't really soccer okay. fans. This is, yeah, this is always my, like, this is my trouble with like how Fox sports treats like soccer. It's, there are a million soccer fans. That's the thing. It's getting them to watch MLS is the issue. There's, the, there's, there's a lot of people. So, and to answer your question, I think digitally, this is going to be covered. Like you don't necessarily need ESPN as you once did. It once was ESPN drove the conversation. And they still do. It's a, it's a, it's a negative for MLS. They don't have a, you know, the games aren't on ESPN in some matter. Uh, and they are on Fox a little bit, but I do think digitally will be driven by that. And I think you're discounting that there's how many soccer fans there actually are. There's just not as many MLS fans. And so what MLS is trying to do is domestically and they've done a pretty good job of it. They've grown the league and they're selling these franchises for hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, it's making soccer fans MLS fans. But it's not only that, it's around the world. It's like, it's just, it's it's messy you're selling around the world. And I think when you look at subscription 
And again, you know, it's a false number because that's just what they agreed upon, the $250 million that uh, Apple is paying MLS and MLS has the production costs. You know, it's a lot less. And I don't think it's gone well. Like, I don't think they're doing that well. Like, I get it. They at EQ said that they're doing well and then didn't take any questions and offer no numbers. I, as I've written a couple of times now, I have a feeling, I just have a feeling numbers may leak out when Messi's on board. I just have a feeling. And I mean, maybe I'm wrong that maybe some place be an ex- scoop in like the wall street journal, uh, where they get the numbers. Uh, and you know, I, that I could see that, but right now we don't know the numbers. All right. So any reporter that's listening to this, when you get the numbers, how many of those are paid? Because that's being given to all, all, all of the the, uh, the season ticket holders. There's a, there, really good. well. Let, let me give you. I that, think the right? number the, the the numbers are going to be good. Yeah. No, well, I, no I would say the numbers are bad. Now you know I'm not going to guess numbers. Cause I don't really know. But yeah, I I, th- I think it's a mistake that they gave it to the season ticket holders. Um, I'd make them pay for it too. But maybe. Well, you know, me like, too. Added, those are the biggest fans. Those are the biggest fans. Andrew, New York Post Sports Plus uh, exclusive uh, on the WWE. Take us through it. Yeah, so my newsletter on Monday, I wrote about how Disney with FX uh, could be in play for the WWE. I also uh, wrote about how and reported that uh, WWE is out of its uh, exclusive window with Fox and with Comcast and USA Network. Uh, And so... Yeah, I think that's possible. I think it's really possible that they could end up at FX um, with one of those packages. Uh, Not ESPN, uh, because uh, ESPN just doesn't have, you know, first off, I don't know, is it a perfect fit? It's, I call it athletic entertainment, WWE. Uh, It's not sports um, necessarily. ESPN is sports. uh, So I don't know if it's a perfect fit that way. But the bigger thing is also they can't just give a Friday and say, hey, Friday's for WWE because they have too many games and too many conflicts. And that's where FX makes a lot of sense. Uh, and so that, that's interesting. You know, there's a lot of sports players involved in this. Um, however, you look at WWE, you know, uh, Vince McMahon built it up and the relationship. Nick Khan, who is the CEO of WWE, now with uh, Endeavor uh, and UFC with Ari Emanuel, Mark Shapiro. Dana White uh, and the relationship there with ESPN. Jimmy Pitaro is the chairman of ESPN. It's actually he's running sports at Disney. So he would be the one that'd be the point person on FX. So that's that's a relationship there. But Amazon, too, with Marie Donahue and company, I do think that they, their, for their strategy, it does fit because Thursday night into Friday, Al Michaels enthusiastically reading promos <laughs> of the WWE. I could see that. I think that's a real possibility as well. I don't see Apple. Uh, I know Netflix. Uh, we're t- it was reported the other day that they're getting to live sports with a like. A By the way, it's not a live sport. It's that wasn't it was a, live a live sport. sport. It was a live <laughs> sport. We're not. We try not to talk about other people's reporting, but that wasn't really um, like they're getting a live sport. Like there's the difference between li- live sports is like you're paying big fees or at least a reasonable fee. Not just putting on events. Andrew, for years, I ignored the WWE because it was the, the, the rights deals were basically being negotiated by entertainment executives. As a, so now that it is, you know, Mark Silverman and Eric Shanks and, and Jimmy Pitaro and Marie Donahue, and you have actually in, in the sports departments, they're the ones that are out there doing it. It, it became uh, more real for me to cover. So I scooped you. Well, I mean, what was a scoop? <laughs> Wait, FX has it? You're right. You know, these days people, I agree with you. That wasn't much of a scoop. You know what? That isn't much of a scoop. People write scoop on all these things. You're right. I, I That was bad by me. Exclusive, uh, I almost, all caps. I almost want to strike that. You called it a, what you called it some kind of exclusive. I didn't even call it that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what I said. I was just trying, I was trying to build you up. That's all. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. Right, let's move on. NBC, big, big news. Pete Bavacqua is exiting uh, as the chairman of NBC Sports Universal uh, and going to Notre Dame, eventually going to be the athletic director, which was his dream job. Uh, anybody who's ever spoken with Bavacqua or knows him knows that uh, he went to ND, was a walk-on punter, uh, loves the fighting Irish, uh, so good for him. Uh, but uh, what does it mean? What's next? Andrew, there have been three chairmen in NBC Sports history. Dick Ebersol, Mark Lazarus, and Pete Bavacqua. This is a big deal, man. Uh, so the, the what's next is there are a bunch of executives, mainly internal. What I'm hearing, they're not going to go external 
to, to fill that position. My betting is with two people. Rick Cordella, who is president of programming and uh, new to that position, he had been uh, at Peacock for a long time. And Jenny Storms, a an ace marketer who uh, is very familiar with Mark Lazarus, having worked with him, you know, back in the '90s at, at, at Turner, and then she kind of went to a bunch of brands and ha- is uh, over at NBC. Those are the two to bet on right now. Yeah, and who are you taking? You don't want to say. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll say you put you put my feet to the fire. I, th- I think it'll be Cordella. Uh, I just don't know when. He's still so, somewhat new to the position, so there there might be an interim bridge there, but eventually it's going to be Cordella. All right, now look, you had a legitimate scoop, a legitimate exclusive. Big noon kickoff. Reggie Bush, who I thought was pretty good on Big Noon kickoff, isn't going to be there anymore. What happened? Well, as of this telling, we are just we're going with this, this is likely happening. Wasn't a done deal. Um, you know, Mark Ingram the second who uh, played last year with the Saints, uh, he looks as if he's going to replace Reggie Bush. So what happened a year ago? Reggie Bush asked for a really exorbitant amount of money for that position. Uh, you know, looking at what the Romos and Brady's make and saying, you know, I should make more. The college football position, you know, that's a close to seven figure job, but you know, can, you know, it's only 12 dates and it's college football pregame. It's different than the NFL and the studio guys uh, in the NFL. Yeah. The big name people can go in there at high numbers. Uh, and then over time they can really make some money, but they, it takes time. And I thought Reggie Bush was okay. Uh, but they looked into maybe replacing him last year uh, when this happened. Now, again, deadlines have been missed. Mark Ingram is strongly considering retiring uh, and going to big noon kickoff. Uh, where he'd be a panelist along with uh, Rob Stone, Urban Meyer, Matt Leiner, and Brady Quinn. Uh, And so I think there's very much a likelihood that that's going to happen. And a big noon kickoff has has made some waves uh, in competing with college game day. So uh, that that is a big story in the college football world. Uh, Could Reggie Bush end up someplace else? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he, when you look at it, it's, it's interesting. College is interesting because, you kind of want the guy who was amazing in college, like Reggie Bush, but then maybe didn't have his great NFL career where he's not going to want to really do college. Uh, he wanted, he want to be on the NFL or he makes too much money. doesn't want to do TV at all. And so Reggie Bush, um, but I think he, he definitely wants to be treated like one of the greatest college football players of all time. Well, it wouldn't be a Mando podcast without talk of the PAC 12, Andrew. And last week we had Kurt, Kirk Schultz, who's the president of Washington State, uh, publicly saying that he expects to have uh, the details of the Pac-12's media rights deal by the uh, end of the month. The end of the month, Andrew, is um, a little more than two weeks away. What are you hearing? The big question is where that would be, you know, and... Look, if we can go down all of them, ESPN, unlikely. Amazon, unlikely. CBS, no. NBC USA, no. Uh, Fox, no. Okay, those are the biggest players. Then you get into Apple. They're a little bit of a wild card. Um, I've heard certain things, but nothing definitively where I'm 100% sure where it stands with Apple. But I I lean towards, I'll just, just so people don't take that the wrong way, lean toward probably not. But I don't know sure exactly, but they also, the Pac-12 has said they don't want to do just an all digital deal. And that's what Apple is pretty much looks like that's their strategy. Of course, they do the baseball deal, but this is a little bit different uh, than the baseball deal. So yeah, that leaves the CW, scripts and, and those type of players. What do you think on those type of guys? You know, there had been reports that they were talking to those companies uh, uh, probably a couple of months ago by now. Uh, that my sources denied and said that they, they, they weren't talking to those uh, companies. When Schultz makes those comments, it's hard because we can report what we know, but we can't report what we don't know. And so what we know is when you went down that roster about like, you know, no after no after no, I'm not sure if ESPN's a no, they're just sort of not a yes for a big package and a, and a, and a big payment, which is, uh, I, I think- well, That's the- where it is. Like, I guess, yeah, the ESPN, I would say if they were to get a deal with ESPN, it'd probably be for low money. Like, yeah. so if they get on ESPN. Yeah. I think if they went to ESPN and say, Hey, let's do a deal. And it's like $20 million per team or something. Then I think maybe they could do that. Or maybe in that range. Like I, I, I would be very surprised if they got the same as the big 12 from ESPN. 
very surprised. Uh, that they would have to cobble a lot of different uh, pieces together in order to get that. Andrew, we haven't done this in a while, uh, but let's bring back our call of the week. Call of the week. We got two of them, John. I know the first one. I'm not sure what you got. You said you had a surprise on the second one. What's the first one? All right. The first one, there is this guy with the Twitter handle Griff. It's G. Adkins. And he, he sent forward a, a nomination of a players only telecast uh, with the Atlanta Braves. It was John Smoltz, Chipper Jones, Tom Glavin, and Jeff Francoeur, Frenchie, uh, calling Ozzy Albee's walk off three run homer recently. And that'll do it. Woo! Start the buses. Poor Larry, the crown. Oh, man. Yeah, that was that was pretty good. Not the greatest calls. We appreciate hearing any nominations uh, for calls of the week. Uh, that was a fun one. Uh, it wasn't Vince Scully, but it was a fun one. All right, now you have a surprise for me. What, what's this other one? Well, look, you had uh, Colin Coward for the first time probably in a year. Adley Rushman's name was not mentioned on the podcast last week. So I have – it's not Adley Rushman, but Kevin Brown of Masson. Kevin Brown – Excellent baseball play by player. Uh, for, he, yeah, he does uh, Orioles games on Masson, and he called this uh, just a smash by Gunnar Henderson. You're going to Omaha. Oh, boy. 3 2, Gunnar. High in the air to right field. Look out below. Oh, what a big blast. This is what you've been waiting for, folks. This is Gunnar Henderson. Oh, 113. I think that flash was really quick, but I thought it said, did that say 460 some feet? It said 462 I feet. So. That is a Utah Street shocker. Andrew, three run homer, longest ball hit, hit onto uh, Utah Street ever in, in, in a uh, regular season game. The Orioles, they're for real. And did you see? The biggest vote-getting catcher in the American League for no the All-Star one, Game. No one cares except for like <laughs> seven people who constantly are tweeting at me and who listen to this pod. This is the sports media pod. Let's right, go let's, O's. Let's go O's. I'm looking at Colin Coward for next week, everybody. Okay, get more <laughs> out of here. All right. Anyways, if you like the pod, please uh, said say have a review. Give us the stars. Uh, follow us and, and listen every week. We appreciate it. Of course, the master of the board is Chris Mason. ACY puts it all together. John, great having you back. Uh, time for bloopers, I think. Ah, it was great. It's great to be back. Thanks for listening, everybody. It was a little tinny. Although I believe Chris said a little tiny. The, the bloopers are going to start here. You can't like, <laughs> like really heavily. Not laughing, one but... blooper. Not one blooper last week. Incredible. <laughs> You're like. <gasps> I know I should have answered right away, but I wasn't expecting that question. <laughs> it's right on the rundown. I know it's on the rundown. I, I, I wasn't. I, I was preparing later. You froze like Walt Disney Sr. <laughs> like Ted Williams' head. In Orlando. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, New York Sports Post. <laughs> We're putting this on the podcast? What? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, happy birthday to Andrew Marshan. Yeah, thank you. All right.